So again, we're talking a little bit about understanding children and helping developing you know, parents. Um, from my side of the coin, it's important that a lot of times parents have no clue what kind of brain type their children are. They assume that they should be wired like they are, and, and guess what? They're not. Often the parent can be wired opposite of the child. So the parent is saying, look, just do it right. Do it my way, do it right. But the child is never going to do it his way. He's going to find his own way for success. So um, this is big with, with the parental role. Okay, so encouraging dependency. Often we, we, we do find parents that, um, especially at high level development, they want the child to, to be dependent on them. Um, like you see in, in the photo, um, Jessica and, and we'll call her Martha. Uh, Martha's doing all the work, carrying everything for her, her little prima donna nationally ranked player. Um, probably is not in her best interest, because guess what? Champions are problem solvers. Um, champions are people that are independent thinkers. They're not dependent on their parents doing everything for them. Um, the co-pilot game, let's go into that just for a sec. Excuse me. From the tennis parent side, um, I'm a tennis parent as well. My, my daughter Sarah um, won 10 national US titles and played the US Open uh, by the age 15. So I did the tennis parent wars. But here's what we did from the age of 11. Whenever we had to go away on a, a national tournament trip, she had to find the airport. And so she was the co-pilot sitting next to me in the car. So she had to find the airport and she had to find parking. And then I would ask her to find the airlines. Um, she would have to find the gate. And when we get off the airplane, I would be right with her the whole way, but she'd have to find baggage claim. Um, after that, she'd have to find the rental car. Um, she'd have to find the hotel and then the tournament site by reading maps and being organized. And it was like pulling teeth. It was difficult, man. But guess what? On the court, guess who was able to solve problems? Sarah. So I really recommend that as you do maybe look into tennis parent workshops, you, you ask your parents to uh, kind of encourage independent thinkers. So is everybody okay so far? You guys can all hear me in back and all? All righty. Understanding the success formula with, with uh, champions or any world-class performer. So what do these folks all have in common? Mozart, Michelangelo, the Beatles, Wayne Gretzky, Yo-Yo Ma, Michael Jackson, Bobby Fischer, Audrey Agassi. So the formula is, is basic. We call it the 10,000 hour rule and we want parents to understand this. It takes about 20 hours a week for 10 years to develop a champion, a world-class violinist, a world-class piano player, a world-class gymnast, or, or a world-class tennis player. So from my side of the coin, I think it's really important that we're gently but brutally honest with parents. We want to make sure they're in reality a little bit if they're chasing the dream of developing a, you know, a high-level player. All right, next blunder. Asking your child to fix a flawed stroke while keeping them on the tournament trail. This is common. We see it week in, week out. Um, parents come to us. They decide as a team, as a unit, they might need to change a serve grip or a certain stroke production issue. After about two weeks, the parents, they put the kid into another tournament. And now the kid basically goes down in flames and loses. Because part of this formula is when you make a change like that, you don't have the new motor program set yet. So the learning curve is it gets worse before it gets better. It's really meaningful that you explain this to the parents and the player. So it takes about four to six weeks for the new motor program to override an old one. So let's kind of walk through it. Let's just say we have a junior player and we decide we have to change a forehand serve grip to a continental serve grip. In the first week, they're going to do the new service grip and hit a proper serve about 10% of the time. 90% is the old motor program. And they're going to hate you a little bit as a coach. This jerk doesn't know anything, man. So they're going to get into that. By the second week, they're going to go into about 20%. They're doing it correctly. 80% is still the old motor program. By the third week, it's kind of getting fun. They're about 40% right, 
60% still the old motor program. Now, this is where most parents put their kid back into a tournament. And guess what the kid says? They go, I know what Frank says. I'll start that next week for sure, but I'm not losing to this little jerk. <laughs> and they go right back to their old. Now, guess who just wasted all the time and all their money? The tennis parent. You're back at ground zero. So it's meaningful that if you're going to make a change like that, a stroke production change, give it four to six weeks. Go ahead. No, I don't think so. I think it really just depends a little bit on uh, what they do during the week. Uh, the unfortunate thing with us being adults is we have to work, so we don't have time to, to work on, you know, on, the, on the skill. Juniors may have a little bit more time. But um, I do believe, though, in the power of shadow swinging at home and, and getting used to building motor programs like that. When I used to work back in the day, I actually worked with Craig Tyler back in the day with Vic Braden in, in the States. And one of the studies we did with a, a famous U.S. coach, Vic Braden, was um, we took a group of adults and they took one lesson a week and they practiced uh, two or three times a week. The other group took a lesson and didn't hit a ball they only were allowed to do shadow swinging. And after six weeks, the group that only did shadow swinging killed the group that practiced. Because they were actually programming good motor programs, and the other group was going back to, they were going back to their old stuff every week. So it was a little bit of a stent of the growth. So, Yeah, sure. Um, are you saying that, that to teach new techniques, you should stay clear of the tournament play altogether while, while they're learning? Can't you use the tournament to... No, I don't think so. I think it just depends on, you'll have to customize that to the player and how dramatic the change is. Often it's just a small adaptation, which they can still play um, in tournaments. Sometimes they might want to just keep that skill set on the practice court. Like, for example, they might be working on a, a slice backhand or a drop shot. So it might be meaningful just to say, look, for this tournament, don't plan on using your drop shot. Keep it kind of on the practice court. Which that could be meaningful there. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. No, you're right on. And sometimes they never will. I agree. And I think those are the students you give to your assistant, pro. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, no. No, but it's, it's a good point. You're right on. We have, we have a player at a club nearby, and everybody calls him the hacker because no matter how many lessons he takes, he, he goes back to his old stuff. But, but he has all the trophies. That's the fun part. He's, he's brutal. <laughs>